we're starting to get the emergence of a rather different view of the gods from what we might regard as the traditional view of the gods. But what's, I think, still very important in all of those authors is that the divine is very much part of the world. Um, it is in the world. The world is constituted, to a certain extent, of beings, of entities that must be described as divine. And the qualities, the characteristics of the divine, which are very important, are, of course, the notion of everlastingness, of, of immortality, of everlastingness, but also the idea, I think, of transformation, the ability to transform. That seems to have been fundamental to people like Thales, who thought perhaps that water was the basic stuff of the universe, and water then can transform itself into all sorts of other things. Ice, rock, air, fire even, perhaps. How that happens, it's not really clear. On top of that, though, we also saw emerging two rather different views of the nature of the world. The one we might say is something associated with Heraclitus, a Heraclitean notion. That is, we're dealing really with a world of becoming. There is no sort of, there's no sort of fixed point in the universe. The world is simply always in the process of change and flux. And that has consequences for knowledge, and it has consequences for the way you can talk about the world. And that's why Heraclitus possibly speaks in the only way he thinks he can speak about the world. He speaks like a god in this somewhat cryptic, paradoxical, riddling, enigmatic way. That's why something is both one thing and the other. The path up and down is one and the same, etc., etc. On the other hand, the, the philosopher we finished with last uh, yesterday, Parmenides, there we're dealing with a world of being as opposed to a world of becoming. And there again are consequences for knowledge, somewhat bizarre consequences. The consequences are there is no change, actually, in reality. There is no, there is no movement there is no was or will be. There is only, presumably, an is. Is is the only thing there is. <laughs> um, all right. So today, let's move on to the inheritance, which is picked up by Socrates and Plato. And I've grouped them together because I need to avoid the long-standing and ongoing controversy, uh, which is known quite often as the Socratic question. And that is the extent to which we can separate the views, doctrines, and thoughts of the historical Socrates, who was a real person who lived in Athens in the 5th century BC, and we know precisely the year he died, 399, and the other real person, Plato, also of Athens, who was um, alive in the late 5th and into the 4th century BC. Now, the big problem, of course, is that Socrates, as one of, um, one of your colleagues um, mentioned to me uh, a moment ago, is that Socrates never actually wrote anything down. So we have no actual writings of Socrates, as I'm sure you all know. We rely then on representations of what Socrates thought and said through Plato. So when we're reading the Platonic works, which have survived, and now we're dealing mercifully with texts that are complete, they are actually complete. There's the Republic of Plato in a translation from beginning to end. We don't have to deal with fragments anymore like we were in the last lecture. But when we're reading these texts, we see Socrates represented talking, putting forward ideas, asking questions. Usually asking questions, actually, rather than putting forward ideas. It's other people who often put forward the ideas. So are we seeing, really, Plato's thought filtered, if you like, through Socrates, or are we seeing Socrates through Plato? For the purposes of this course, I think that that is not really a question we need to get into. So mercifully, I'd like to leave that aside and rather look at them as simply representations of thought. Socrates is one of the principal protagonists in this, this philosophical drama that Plato um, presents us with. And it is a drama because Plato's works are all dialogues. They are all conversations of some kind or another. Sometimes just conversations between two people, but very often conversations between many people, several people. Now, the notion of the divine, references to gods, are virtually sort of littered 
throughout these texts. So you, you, can't, you can barely turn a page of Plato without some reference to the divine. And in a lecture of this kind, it would be impossible to really try and cover all of them. So what I've selected really are just a few dialogues where I think we can see some significant points which we can take away as in some way um, a kind of a, a summative notion of what Plato and possibly Socrates say about the divine. And so I'm going to concentrate on the Phaedo, a dialogue that presents us with um, Socrates on the very last day and even the last hours and minutes and seconds of his life when he's awaiting execution in prison. The Apology, which represents Plato's representation of his defense speech at his trial. The Euthyphro, which is a dialogue between just two people, Socrates and a person who claims to be an expert on all things holy and religious. And that man's name is Euthyphro. Socrates meets him when he's about to have his preliminary hearing for his trial, sitting outside the magistrate's office. The Republic, which everybody has heard of, a extensive, reasonably extensive work in 10 books, um, where Socrates is talking about actually the nature of justice, although he ends up talking about how human beings might live together in a more just way. And finally, the rather enigmatic work, the Timaeus, where in fact Socrates doesn't do most of the talking, but a person from the West named Timaeus does the talking. Okay, so Socrates, Plato. Socrates' questions have a particular kind, and very often you'll see that he's obsessed with what we might describe as the question of cause. In the Phaedo, the dialogue which uh, dramatizes his final hours and his conversations with his friends in those final hours, Socrates tells his friends in an interesting little autobiographical piece how he initially was interested in the writings of the physikoi. The physikoi is a Greek word, a word used by the Greeks at this time, to designate the kind of people we looked at yesterday, people like Heraclitus, people like Anaximander, Parmenides, and others. So he tells us that as a younger man, that's what he was fascinated by, that kind of discussion, those kinds of questions. And we might compare the way he is represented by the Athenian comic poet Aristophanes in the surviving play, The Clouds. There we have Socrates represented as a character in a comedy. And he is introduced to us in that comedy by... Um, <laughs> an individual, an older man, who wants to learn basically stuff at Socrates' school so he can get himself out of debt. And he goes to the school and he finds Socrates hanging in a basket in midair. And Socrates is supposedly communing with the, at a height with the kind of refined air that you find in the upper atmosphere, which is most akin to the kind of substance that makes up our minds. And so in order to get a clearer head, quite literally, he's up in this sort of firmament <clears throat> so he can get closer to it and think more clearly. The chorus of that comedy are made up of clouds. Nephelai. Do you remember that word nephos from Xenophanes yesterday? And I told you that a nephele, the feminine form of that noun, is actually a goddess. Aristophanes makes the clouds goddesses who are actually responsible for the creation of the entire universe. They, in fact, say, it's actually not Zeus, it's us. So there is a representation in Aristophanes of Socrates being interested in this kind of inquiry at an earlier stage. Now, in the Phaedo, Socrates mentions a specific physikos, a specific, in our terminology, pre-Socratic philosopher, and that is Anaxagoras of Clazomenae. Clazomena is another city in that Ionian area of the west of Turkey where many Greeks had settled. And he's, he's associated with the 5th century BC. He died in 428 BC. And we have, again, some fragments of his work. Fragment one. Together, he says, were all things, infinite both in quantity and in smallness, for the small too was infinite. 
So an interesting perspective here. He's not just saying that it, everything was infinitely large, that it went on forever and ever and ever as far as you could imagine, but it also went as far as you could imagine to the microcosm as well. There was no smallest piece of it. There's no point where you could say that is the smallest grain of stuff in the universe. There is no smallest grain in Anaxagoras' idea of the stuff of the universe. And when all things were together, none was patent. In other words, none was, none was actually detectable by an imaginary observer by reason of smallness. For air and ether, these two specific substances that he selects, covered all things, being both infinite for in all things, these are the greatest, both in quantity and size. Now, I'm no sub logician or scientist. Many of you who may well be <laughs> might detect that there are sort of logical problems with the kinds of things that um, Anaxagoras is claiming here. But I don't really want to get into those just yet. He continues, this being so, one should believe that in everything that is combining, there are present many things of every sort and seeds of all things having all kinds of shapes and colors and savors. But before they separated off, when all things were together, not even color was present, or patent rather. For this was prevented by the commixture of all things, of the wet and the dry and the bright and the dark, and much earth present therein, and seeds, infinite in quantity, in no way like one another. It's rather confusing, and of course Anaxagoras is not necessarily claiming that these things he selects for mention are the only things. I think they are meant to be simply representative examples of the kinds of many different stuffs that make up our, our, our universe, our world. But what he is claiming, which is quite a remarkable thing, is that everything you can imagine actually ultimately contains everything as well. So to sort of make it material or to concretize it in some way, you might sort of think that, I don't know, this, this sort of, these glass spectacles, that's plastic, right? But according to Anaxagoras, it's not, it may be predominantly plastic because that's what's patent to the touch and the analysis that you conduct on it of any kind. But actually there's every other stuff that is in the universe in here as well. There is bone, there is um, water, there is wood, there is stone, there is fire. Everything you can possibly imagine and have detected within the universe. And all the things you, of course, have never detected because we are limited in our capacity to what we can see and detect. That's all in there. No matter how small the section you took of this particular sort of piece of uh, the glasses, the spectacles frame. So quite a re weird, remarkable idea. The other important thing that Anaxagoras introduces and develops more than any other pre-Socratic philosopher is the idea of mind, what he calls nous. Mind, he tells us, is something infinite and self-controlling. And it has been mixed with no thing but is alone itself by itself. Now, I appreciate the importance of that. Everything else in the universe, the cosmos, is itself contaminated by everything else, for want of a better terminology. The only thing that, if you like, is not contaminated by anything else, and I'm not precisely sure how that happens, is this thing that he calls mind. And it's actually very important for Anaxagoras' model of the universe that this should be so, as he tells us. For if it were not by itself, but had been mixed with some other thing, then it would share in all things. Yes, it would, according to Anaxagoras' um, views here. If it had been mixed with any of them, it would have to be mixed ultimately with everything, because that's the way the universe is. For in everything, as he says, there is a present, a share of everything except for noose, except for mind. And the things commingled with it would have prevented it from controlling anything in the way in which it does. Because then it would be like the other stuff. And if he wants to give mind, presumably on some analogy from our own experience as human beings, a particularly privileged position in the universe, 
then it can't be commingled with that thing. Either in us or, of course, from his point of view, in the cosmos itself. Because he's not just talking about our human minds. He's talking about something else. It is the finest of all things, the purest. And it possesses all knowledge about everything. And it has the greatest strength. What we're seeing here, in a, I think, in an interesting way, is a sort of transformation, really, of the embryonic thing that we started with, perhaps, in Lecture 1, and that is the mind of Zeus, aren't we? Zeus also has a particularly privileged knowledge, you might say, about all things. And he has the greatest strength. Zeus is nowhere to be seen in this description, though. Mind controls all those things, both great and small, which possess soul. And mind controlled, not only that, but the whole revolution. He's talking about the revolution of the cosmos. So that it revolved in the first place. So it turns out that noose, mind, is the cause of a particular kind of motion. A motion that ends in order. The kind of order we can see in the cosmos when we look up at the sky at night. And first it began to revolve in a small area, and it is revolving more widely, and it will revolve yet more widely. So it, it's an evolving universe, according to Anaxagoras. There is change there, but it's change under very, very strict constraints. Yes. Well, his model is clearly human consciousness. That must be his model. That's how he gets to this. But, of course, what he would be saying, I'm, I'm assuming, and most interpreters agree, is that the mind that we have is, must be the same, of the same kind as the mind that is the thing that makes the universe ordered. And that places us above animals. It would do, by implication, yes, it would do, depending on what sort of... Sorry? He doesn't seem to make that point. So that point is not made explicitly. There are some people who take that line, that in some way um, we're talking about a hive, if you like, that our minds um, are ultimately then, because it's the same mind that is driving the universe, that our minds, a bit like, I don't understand computers, or one of our colleagues does over there, but, you know, a bit like the internet in a sense, that, you know, it, it's, it's all those small machines sort of chugging away that result in this remarkable supra thing, the internet. Um, and one could take that line, but it's not a line he seems to take, at least not explicitly. So some people have suggested that's what it might be. Others have taken a rather less um, ambitious uh, line of interpretation. But of course that is a very interesting one. All right, so this idea of consciousness is consciousness of, it's consciousness of itself, it's conscious of what it's doing. Now, let's get back to Socrates. I once heard, he says in the feed, of someone reading from some book of Anaxagoras, he claimed, and asserting that it is intelligence. This is what um, uh, Trednik's translation for noose. It doesn't really matter what we do. We could do mind, intelligence. That organizes things and is the reason for everything. This explanation pleased me, he says. Somehow it seemed right. He doesn't say quite why. He can't explain perhaps why, but somehow it seemed right that intelligence should be the reason for everything. It's part of our experience, or at least perhaps our optimistic experience. <laughs> we hope that people do things because their minds have caused them to do it as opposed to something else. And so he's fascinated by this and he wants to discover what are the implications. So he goes out, he buys himself his own copy of Anaxagoras' book. Socrates' assumptions about what Anaxagoras, Anaxagoras would explain through mind or nous in the universe would be questions like, first of all, whether the Earth is flat or round or spherical. But then, more importantly, why it had to be flat or round or spherical with reference to what is better. Because the mind 
as Socrates assumes for most of us, the mind sort of makes decisions on the basis of preferences, on the basis of deciding and calculating what is better and what is worse, what to pursue and what to avoid. So he wants to know what way would it be shown by Anaxagoras that it is better that the world should be like it is as opposed to something else in some other form. And he's very disappointed. As I read on, I says, I discovered a man who made no use of his intelligence. There is actually a little joke there in the feeder, of course. Is it the noose of Anaxagoras or the noose that he has in his, in his philosophy? And assigned to it no responsibility for the order of the world, actually. But adduced reasons like air and ether and water and many other oddities. Um, several scholars looking at this passage, looking at our fragments of Anaxagoras, have claimed, and they may have some, I think, point, that Socrates is not being maybe entirely fair to Anaxagoras here. It seemed to me that he was about as inconsistent as if someone were to say, the reason for everything Socrates does is intelligence. And then in trying to account for my several actions, said, first, the reason that Socrates is sitting here now is that his body is composed of bones and sinews, and the bones are rigid and separated at the joints, but the sinews are capable of contraction and relaxation, and the fo form an envelope around the bones with the help of the flesh and the skin, the latter holding all together. And since the bones move freely in their joints, the sinews, by relaxing and contracting, enable me somehow to bend my limbs. And that is the reason for my sitting here in a bent position. <laughs> perhaps more importantly, or again, if he tried to account the same way for my conversing with you. I remember Fido, in the Fido, he's conversing with his friends because he's about to be executed. Adducing reasons such as sound and air and hearing and a thousand others. And never trouble to mention the real reasons. Tas hos salethos aitias in the Greek, which are that since Athens has thought it better to condemn me, therefore I, for my part, have thought it better to sit here and more right to stay and submit to whatever penalty she orders. Because by the dog, I fancy that these sinews and bones would have been in the neighborhood of Megara or Boeotia, cities far, places far from Athens, long ago, impelled by a conviction of what is best if I did not think that it was more just and honorable to submit to whatever penalty my country orders rather than take to my heels and run away. And of course, he's referring to a tradition which Plato has in another diet of the Crito, where it was made quite clear that Socrates could have escaped from prison. Um, the warden of the prison was quite, quite prepared to be bribed, and he could, have been, he could have been sneaked out of the country. He could have got away, but in the Crito he argues, no, I need to stay. So, although perhaps Socrates is not being entirely fair to Anaxagoras, what he does suggest, and I think from the available fragments there is some point to this, that Nous is given an initial, an initial purpose of starting things off, but it isn't involved in any sort of sustaining way, and it doesn't do what we know or think minds do, and that is make decisions on the basis of some kind of knowledge that this particular activity, course of action, decision, is better than another kind. All right, so let's go back in time a little to the apology, the defense speech. Remember that Socrates is charged with corrupting the young and not having consideration for the gods which the city has consideration for, but for other newfangled divine entities. Huge problems on how to translate the term that's used in that text, daimonia kaina. The word kainos, which is an adjective in Greek, means new or newfangled, sometimes almost kind of made up. Um, this word is a word associated with anything divine. It can be, in fact, a word which just means God. Uh, it doesn't have to be different from another word like theos for God. All right. Now, in his defense of the, against these charges, um, and Socrates does several things, which we won't have time to go into in detail, but let's just select the ones perhaps particularly relevant for our topic. He's got this reputation for wisdom, 
And he thinks that that's in fact the thing that's really driving the prosecution. The reason he's at trial really is not, re is not actually those charges. It's really the reputation he has and the fact that he's become unpopular in the city of Athens because he's basically a pain in the ass. So with respect to his reputation for, reputation for wisdom, Socrates calls as witness in his defense the god at Delphi. It's a remarkable thing to do. Nobody else has ever done that in a trial at Athens. You don't call as a character witness a god. The Greeks believed in gods, the Athenians did, but they didn't call gods to witness. This is not done. The form that this takes is that a friend of his named Chirophon went to Delphi once and asked whether there was anyone wiser than Socrates. Now, if you ask the god at Delphi a silly question, I suppose you're going to get a silly answer, aren't you? And my reading of what the Pythian priestess, who of course is the spokesperson for the god, said was simply no. <laughs> um, the Pythian priestess replied that there was no one. Now, how do you interpret an utterance like that? The utterance impels Socrates to undertake a lifelong search. I said to myself, what is the god saying and what is his hidden meaning? I am only too conscious that I have no claim to wisdom, great or small. So what can he mean by asserting that I am the wisest? And you can see what Socrates has already done there. He's engaged in an interpretation of what the god meant. Is anyone wiser than Socrates? No. It doesn't, I think, as an English language speaker, or a Greek language speaker for that matter, necessarily mean that Socrates is wisest simply means that no one is wiser than him, which is not the same thing as he is the wisest, as far as I can see. He cannot be telling a lie, says Socrates. That would not be right for him. And he uses an interesting word. The word he uses is themis. Now, themis in the Hesiodic theogony, that great poem telling Greeks about the gods, is actually a goddess. She's a goddess of right, of justice. She's actually a goddess from the old order, the pre-Zeus order, but a, a goddess that, although she belongs to the former regime, Zeus is very, very uh, anxious to, to, uh, to sort of uh, cultivate. He gives her special privileges as a goddess. So this notion of right does have a divine flavor to it. Socrates then seems convinced without question that gods don't lie. So already we've, I think, extracted from Socrates' own words, as represented by Plato, something that Socrates seems absolutely clear about, or at least that's a belief he has, despite the fact that Homer and Hesiod do tell us that the gods lie. Clearly Socrates doesn't believe that. So what he's faced with is a contradiction something that seems to him false, if you take it as a statement that I am the wisest, maybe he's mistaken. And another belief that he has, which contradicts that, that gods don't lie. After puzzling about it for some time, I set myself at last with considerable reluctance to check the truth of it in the following way. And what he does, of course, is engage in a life, effectively, of philosophy. He finds people who have a reputation for wisdom and knowledge, and he questions them. He questions them in the hope of finding somebody who is in fact wiser than him to indicate that he's not the wisest. And in every single instance so far, up until this trial, he has unfortunately been disappointed by the people he's questioned. Is there any attempt to define wisdom? Not at this stage. What he says in the Apology certainly is simply that People sometimes have knowledge of a particular form of expertise. So, for example, he goes deliberately to uh, people who are artisans and craftsmen and asks them questions because he knows that they know how to make stuff that he doesn't know. So, plumbers, electricians, you know, pe computer programmers, he asks those people. But then what he finds is in the conversation that on the basis of, say, knowing how to uh, write computer code, people also think that they know who should be president of the country. And that 
he finds that they actually don't seem to really have the knowledge that he can trust in that respect. So on the basis of some other kind of compartmentalized knowledge, people often move to broader applications of knowledge. They think that their knowledge of this particular thing will make them um, knowledgeable about something else. They, they transfer the uh, focus of their specific knowledge to something that's inappropriate. So for example, um, I, I'm not saying I have views on this, but you know, we, I've, you hear on the, in the media where people have been incredibly good at, I don't know, kind of running very complex businesses or commercial activities. The assumption might be that they should be in government and they should be doing that um, so that, that the knowledge is transferable. In Socrates' view, or at least in Socrates' experience, and it may not be our experience, but in his experience, he's disappointed in the way they try to, to do that. He finds that they, they, they fail under examination. Yeah. Um, there are... Uh, sorry, the question was, uh, are, there, are there records of the Pythian uh, priestesses' utterances? They, um, the answer to that is that there are some, yes. They are, um, they are scattered through works like the work of the historian Herodotus from the 5th century BC. He will, often, he will quite often quote responses from the Pythian priestess. So we do have, we do have little, little um, uh, some teasers. Scholars are undecided as to how authentic those are, whether they're, they're, they're the sort of the product, if you like, of, of uh, gossip or Herodotus's sources or his, his own imagination, for example. So people are not entirely confident about how reliable they are, but, but I think what's more important is that those represent the kind of things that Greeks thought the Pythian priestess would say. So in some ways, they're reliable in that respect. So, Socrates then, interestingly, sees his life, his life of philosophy, as a life of service to the god, the god of Delphi specifically, but maybe the god in a more general and, and rather less specific sense, and even likens his activities as a cycle of labors, like the heroes Theseus and Heracles and Jason, um, who are effectively doing what they do in obedience to God. It's quite an interesting way in which he articulates his life. So that's quite significant, that Socrates sees a life of philosophy as in some way a life of service to divinity. And so he makes himself spokesman for the oracle. Uh, if the Pythian priestess can't always speak, <laughs> he speaks for the Pythian priestess and ask myself whether I would rather be as I was, neither wise with their wisdom, nor ignorant with their ignorance, or possess both qualities as they did. I reply through myself to the oracle, he becomes his own oracle, <laughs> that it was best for me to be as I was. And somebody, I forget who it was, um, yesterday did of course uh, remind us that know thyself is a key, uh, a fundamental injunction associated with the cult of Apollo at Delphi. And this is, of course, in some ways, Socrates getting to know himself in a, in a strange way. So the charge then that is made, that he introduces new entities, new divine entities, well, he refutes that second charge in a somewhat sophistic way by arguing that surely if he thinks that there are such things as daimonia, then he must also think that there are such things as theia. Now I'm, just, I'm exploiting here, because I don't know what else to do, the two Greek terms. He was accused of having consideration only for newfangled daimonia, divine entities. He says, if I think there are such things as divine entities, then I must also think there are such things as, let's say for convenience, godlike entities. They are. And the paradigm he exploits here is the following. You know, if you think there are such things as mules, so mules would correspond to daimonia, 
then you must think there are such things as horses. Because you couldn't have mules without horses. Um, so I'm, I'm not a zoologist, I, 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 I fall, I've got, I've got this right. Aren't, aren't mules a kind of a cross between a horse and a, and a, and a donkey? Yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> and they're sterile, yeah. And I think the, um, the, the actual, as always, you know, Plato never says anything without some significance. And although it's not explicit, it's of course fascinating to muse on whether, why are mules chosen in this particular instance? He then equates it rather more directly. If you think that there are such things as the illegitimate children of gods, the bastard sons of gods, as he says, the nothoi, the Greek word for an illegitimate child, a nothos, you must think that there are such things as gods. It's an interesting argument. It's a, a kind of one of those provocative, playful arguments that Socrates very often makes. Um, as you can imagine, the apology, which all just means defense speech in ancient Greek, doesn't really do Socrates any favors. It's uncompromising in many respects. It's provocative. Um, he doesn't sort of take time off from his normal way of speaking when he's speaking before these 501 jurors. And the other thing, of course, which is important and is brought up in the Apology is the thing that he calls several times in the various Platonic dialogues his daimonion which is often translated in English as his supernatural sign. It's far less specifically that in the Greek. It just means my, 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 my sort of divine thing, my, my sort of, I don't even want to use the super word supernatural. It's very misleading supernatural in the Greek experience. But that thing that is uncanny, it's, it's, it's not of the human world, you know what I mean? It's, it's something divine about it. And this divine thing, he tells us, tells him not to do things. It opposes him. Many people have said that. Many people have said it sounds very much like a conscience. It does sound very much like a conscience. But he himself wasn't silent. Um, but he wasn't silent. The 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 Well, we're talking about this entity, Daimonion, which somehow accompanies Socrates. He's not clear on what form it takes. It seems to take the form of a voice, a voice that only he can hear. And it only speaks sometimes. It doesn't say very much. It actually only says don't, effectively, in very, very specific contexts, even quite trivial ones. So some people have said it does seem to resemble a conscience. Now, this daimonion, which only opposes him when it says he's taking the wrong course, was entirely silent the whole day of this trial. So it's never said to him while he was talking, you shouldn't be talking in the way you're talking. And so he trusts it, or at least he takes that as a very good sign that what he's done, even though it's, going, it's led to his execution, is a good thing. All right, so the question of God is absolutely central, I would suggest, in the last public statement that Socrates is meant to have made on trial before 501 Athenian citizens. The awkward questions that Socrates asks experts as I said, the Euthyphro gives us a nice example because it's an example which, again, relates directly to the notion of divinity. Euthyphro claims to be a seer, a mantis. We've seen one or two of those before. And he asks the seer the question, what is holiness and unholiness to hosion and to anosion? That's just simply the opposite of this. It's the negation of it, annosion versus hosion. Right? Quite difficult to translate the word hosion. Um, holiness is, is often used. Some people use piety. It's very, very difficult. But it's essentially a value term, and it's a value term associated with the divine, with the gods. Um, Socrates asks Euthyphro this because Euthyphro claims to be an expert. Um, and Euthyphro is an expert who's doing some quite unusual things. He's actually about to prosecute his own father for murder. 
Um, and Socrates says, gosh, that's unusual. Most sons don't do that. Um, but Euthyphrus says, no, it is the holy thing to do. Yeah. And that's why he gets asking these questions. Because Socrates says, well, it's a fantastic coincidence. Thank goodness I met you. I'm about to be put on trial effectively for not having consideration for the gods. And here I happen to meet an expert outside the magistrate's court. Uh, so, you know, could you please inform me? Now, he eventually gets Euthyphro to offer a definition to this apparently quite innocuous question. What is holiness? What is unholiness? And the answer that's given is holiness is that which is agreeable to the gods and unholiness is that which is not agreeable to the gods. Um, actually, as he eventually gets him to say, to all the gods, because there's quite a lot of conversation of uh, which gods. Some gods, you know, do, do all the gods have the same views on every single thing? He goes on like that. Socrates then asks this question, and it's a question that doesn't get answered in the dialogue. It, uh, this Euthyphro is one of the so-called aporetic dialogues. It doesn't end with a resolution or an answer. And Socrates asks, is the holy approved by the gods because it is holy, or is it holy because it is approved. <laughs> but what we there see, I think, is a hint of the possibility in this second question. Is it holy because it is approved? We get a hint that, of course, we might be dealing with attributes versus something more fundamental. And Socrates and Plato seem to be more interested in this question. Is the holy approved by the gods because it is holy? Which, of course, still requires us to try and answer the question then, what is holy? Because the gods, therefore, have a particular attitude towards it because of what it is. It isn't what it is because of the gods' attitude. This gives us some insight in Plato's view of what the divine might be. Because if it's something that the divine have an attitude towards, then it's relevant to the divine. Let's turn to the Republic. In the Republic, the subject of gods emerges from discussion of how justice and injustice might originate in a community. Now, there are several cities that emerge in the conversation. In the first city that Socrates conjures up in the conversation, uh, one of his uh, interlocutors, Glaucon, says, that's a city of pigs. <laughs> um, it's a very, very simple city. It's there, it just satisfies everyone's basic needs, and everyone seems particularly satisfied. And there we find the gods are not an issue. The citizens simply pray to their gods with garlands on their heads after they have feasts, when their harvests are in, and they enjoy one another's company. There's no sort of issue or problem or discussion about divinity. But the people that Socrates is talking to or with are not satisfied with that city. It's, um, as one says, a city of pigs. And so they want a city which is kind of more like Cape Town. <laughs> a, a city with more desires that need to be satisfied. Um, you know, we want a Woolworths food. We, 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 we don't want the simple, very basic foods that are available to us, um, as they might be in somewhere like, I don't know, Port Alfred. A city as Socrates will say, it's actually a city with a fever. It's a feverish city. And that city will require warriors to protect it. And that's where we get the emergence of the notion of the guardians. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with these concepts. The guardians who protect the city. And they are divided, subdivided eventually into the warrior guardians, the auxiliaries as they're called, and the supreme guardians who become the equivalent almost of philosopher kings. Right? Now these warriors will have to be trained very, very carefully and they will have to have inculcated in them the correct values. Because if they don't, they will be fearsome. They will turn their force, their strength, their power on the very citizens that they are meant to protect. And an important component in inculcating the right values will be the kinds of stories that are told to them, including those which are told about the gods. Now, the stories that are told to them must represent the gods in their education, the gods as they actually are. And again, we can glean from this text then some views from Socrates and Plato about what the gods are like. 
we learn that Homer and Hesiod told false stories about the gods and they made, importantly, bad verbal likenesses. They don't make likenesses in the form of statues and paintings, but they make likenesses in words. And these are bad. They're bad because they misrepresent. They don't represent the gods as they are. Because the god is in truth good, and so must be so described. And nothing good is harmful. These are sort of non-negotiables, it would seem. The god is also supremely beautiful. So he or she would not alter his or her shape. Because to do so would to be assuming a shape that is worse, that is inferior. So we can't have representations of Athena turning into a bird. You just can't do that, because a god wouldn't do that. Uh, well, it might be a start, yeah. Um, so, for example, if, if one were evaluating whether a poet were doing holy things or not, then, of course, this would be perhaps one of the criteria you would use, that um, you must represent a god as he or she actually is. And there are, obviously, these very strict uh, general guidelines. So the non-negotiable is that God is good. So God cannot do harm to anybody or anything. Does that include Zeus? Yes, you would have to. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, so taking a mortal woman sexually against her will, that's bad. You can't represent a, a god raping a, a, a mortal female, despite the fact that, you know, in the traditional tales and stories and poems, you know, it's full of that. You know, and that's, of course, why in the Republic we have the censorship, you know, of tragedy and Homer, because the kind of things that are, the gods are represented doing is just, well, inconscionable. Yes. Well, exactly, yes. So the apology is not entirely consistent with the Republic. No. They're both Plato. So he, he's, he's writing all of this. He's composing all of this. He's representing Socrates talking. There are ways of trying to explain these apparent inconsistencies. So when we look at the, for example, the apology case, the way that that argument proceeds, if when you read it, um, you may disagree if you read it yourself, but one might make an argument, um, not to get too far into this, but we might make an argument that um, what Socrates is doing there is actually engaging the prosecutor in the argument. So he's not necessarily committing himself to saying or actually say, believing himself that the gods do have sexual intercourse with inferior beings. He's not necessarily committing himself to that. If you look at the text, there's a way in which you could say Socrates is going through the motions of asking his prosecutor, if one were, to, if I were, or one were to say this, would it not be the case that, rather than a statement of faith on the part of him, because most of the time, Socrates does seem to ask questions, like he does of Euthyphro. He says to Euthyphro, "Do you do you really think the gods did those things?" He doesn't say, "I don't believe they did," but in the Euthyphro, he asks Euthyphro, "Do you really think the?" Do you really think Zeus cast no, not Zeus? Do you really think Kronos castrated his own father? You know, he actually asked that question, and Euthyphro said, "Yes." He says, and many other things which are even worse that people don't know about, <laughs> which we have to keep secret from the, the, the great majority of humans because they just couldn't take it. All right, so. In the Republic as well, what comes across, and something we see in other dialogues, that there is a part of us that is akin to the divine. 
Um, in the Republic, we see a tripartite soul, a soul divided into three parts, a reasoning part, something which is called the spirit, <clears throat> and then these appetites. And it's the reasoning part that is akin, that is in some way related to the divine. It's the reasoning of part, of course, which will have the noose, if we're using those terms as well. In the Timaeus, which I'm going to move to at the very end of this lecture, we see that the most sovereign part of our soul, this is a lovely quote from the Timaeus, raises us up away from the earth and towards what is akin to us in heaven. So exploiting the traditional idea here that the upper reaches of the sky are associated with divinity, that sovereign part of us, the reason where the noose is, actually symbolically, metaphorically, and maybe in some other real sense as well, raises us. In the Phaedo, we are told that body is a hindrance to the activity of the reasoning soul. And philosophy, which engages the reasoning soul, is an activity of purification of the soul from the body. And that's why philosophers are better dead people than non-philosophers, according to Socrates' statements in the Phaedo. Because most of us, are, our souls are effectively riveted to our flesh. And so the separation of the soul from the body at death is a very, very painful and traumatic experience. And we are traumatized as souls after being removed from it because we actually have scars and tears and wounds in our souls. You can't get the damn thing out of that body. Whereas the philosopher has done his best to make sure that his soul is as uncontaminated by the bodily um, attachments as it possibly can be. As he says, by keeping ourselves uncontaminated by the follies of the body, we shall probably reach the company of others like ourselves and gain direct knowledge of all that is pure and uncontaminated. That is presumably, that's always the qualifications in Socrates' statements, presumably of truth, to alethes. For one who is not pure himself to attain to the realm of purity would no doubt be a breach of the divine order. And I only mention this quotation from the Phaedo because we see the re-emergence of that themis word. This is the adjective of themis, themiton. Me u, very strong negative in Greek. Me u themiton e. Certainly, absolutely not righteously, divinely righteous. So really just not on. And he's used the word associated with divine law, perhaps. Is that why he committed suicide? Uh, well, the suicide was, of course, although uh, I suppose in some sense a voluntary act, it's uh, a form of execution. Because the Athenians at this time executed not everybody, but most people through poison. So you had to drink the poison. Um, Now, I'm going back to a pre-Socratic just quickly. In, we've only got a few more minutes. Empedocles of Acragas. And I need to mention him very, very briefly because he's a 5th century um, person who is, of course, uh, an older contemporary of Socrates. And he's another one of these people who um, has this interesting uh, picture of the cosmos. And he says that the cosmos is comprised of four basic stuffs what some later Greek authors call elements, the earth, the water, the fire, and the air. He actually calls them rizdomata, which is simply a Greek word meaning roots. Um, and he can account, he believes, for everything in the world by a mixture of these four basic primary, <laughs> primary stuffs, if you like. But th we need something else. And according to Empedocles, there are two entities that, in some mysterious way, act upon these four roots, these four stuffs. And that is love. Greek terms he seems to use for them are philia, philoteus, very, very sort of similar ideas. And that somehow, um, sorry, these are switched, I beg your pardon. This is somehow among them. So love is among them. This is a mistake. They should be the other way around. Love is among the roots. And then there's something else which he calls nekos, strife. That's apart from them. And they have particular effects on these stuffs. 
Um, I'm going to skip that. The first four, four roots of all things, though, in another fragment, he actually does give divine names to. He calls the one Zeus, the one Hera, the one Idoneus, which is a name of Hades, and Nestis. So we have then Zeus as fire, we have Hera as air, Hades as earth, Nestis as water, the goddess Nestis. But it would seem that although he gives some sort of divinity to these basic components, it's important that these two other entities, which are not, it must be stressed, any of the primary elements themselves, act upon them. Love brings things together and strife separates them. And there's some evidence that he used these two forces to um, posit a cycle of um, sort of change within the cosmos. That the cosmos changes and goes through cycles of being completely altogether and being completely all separate. But in the intervening sections between complete completeness and complete separateness, we have the world that we're more familiar with, where we have processes of both um, dislocation and combination, kind of in between, as it were. He also believed in incarnation, uh, particularly of what the Greeks called metempsychosis, reincarnation. Now, I had to mention it very briefly because the last Platonic work we need to look at is the Timaeus. And in the Timaeus, we find cosmic applications of the divine. The world of our experience is a world that has come into being. It has an origin. And because it's come into being and has an origin, it has to be corporeal. It's body. It's visible. It's tangible. It's accessible to the senses. We can see it. We can touch it. We can taste it. It is, in this dialogue, constructed out of the same four elements that we had in Empedocles. Fire, water, air, and earth. It turns out, too complicated to really try and get into here, that these materials are not themselves the ultimate constituents. They themselves have a deeper underlying structure. But that's another person. But the most important thing in this last section is that there is a divine artisan. The famous demiurgos that Timaeus talks about in this dialogue. The premises and the argument proceed initially in the following way. First of all, being differs from becoming. Think back to Heraclitus and Parmenides. Parmenides being, Heraclitus becoming. Unresolvable. What Plato in the Timaeus seems to do is to say that we do have the two things. The two things, if you like, are there. But they are very different from one another. All becoming has a cause. Being doesn't have to have a cause. It is its own cause. When a craftsman makes something come into being by looking to some eternal paradigm, and the eternal paradigm has to be, of course, therefore an instance of being as opposed to becoming, then the outcome is necessarily fine. It's necessarily beautiful. Whereas when the craftsman or artisan looks to a created paradigm, then the outcome is necessarily not fine. So if you look, use as your paradigm for what you're creating, something, for example, that's in the world, then what is produced is not fine or beautiful in the same way as the other kind of creative um, activity is. It's not necessarily not fine or not necessarily fine? Is necessarily not fine. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Now, the cosmos, the universe, is a case of becoming. And we could say that, well, Plato would say that for many reasons, but one of the most straightforward ones is simply because it's perceptible. The fact that we can see it with our eyes and hear it and touch it means that it is an instance of becoming. It's not an instance of being. So he would agree with Heraclitus in some way here that the universe that we know by experience. First of all, we can't actually know it. That's another issue. But it, 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 you can't say of the universe that it actually is, because that's being. 
What we have is something different from his. We have becoming. The Greek verbs used are esti and gignomai, which we don't have quite the same in English. The cosmos then has a cause, and the cause in the case of the cosmos is this craftsman who looks to an eternal model when crafting the universe, because this eternal model must be the model he used, because the maker of our universe is divine and good, and the universe is beautiful. So the world's status as a likeness of the eternal model is what is being claimed here. The universe then is actually a likeness, a created likeness, of something else that we will never see, that we can perhaps only imagine, and even then very, very poorly. The God who put this world together was good, and what is good is without envy. So he wished that all things be as like himself as possible. So this divine artisan who created our world, and notice we're interesting here, we're in a realm of creation, um, it isn't, isn't stingy with good things. There are restraints, because the object he's created is an object of becoming as opposed to of being. So there are always going to be limitations to how beautiful this thing is. It can never be as beautiful as the thing on which it's based. Because that thing is a reality, it's an is, as opposed to our own world, which is a, be a becoming. Finding the visible world in disordered movement, he reduced it to order, the Timaeus says. Again, I find this interesting. So what the Timaeus seems to sort of suggest is that the stuff of the world is essentially there. It's stuff that the creator uses to make this cosmos, if you like. It's not um, stuff that he creates itself. So it's, a bit, it's somewhat different from the Old Testament narrative, maybe, in Genesis, where you know, stuffs themselves, if you like, are being made. Here, the raw material, if you like, of the universe seems to be there available to the artisan. Now, the last point there. Since he realized that anything with mind, nous, we're back to Anaxagoras again, aren't we, in a way, is superior to anything without it, he placed mind in soul and soul in body and so ensured that the whole would be natural, wouldn't be naturally the best. And then, nice summary. And so the most likely account, do you remember Heraclitus? listening not to me but to the account he says you see these habits of thinking which are reaching even across this more than a hundred years between heraclitus and, and plato when he writes this the most likely account and of course that's all he can really say likely must say that this world this cosmos came to be in very truth through the gods providence pronoia a living being with soul and intelligence. This is what the world is, the cosmos, the universe. It's a zoa, which of course is the word in Greek for an animal, something that's alive. It's alive. It has a soul. It's emsuchon. Whoops. And it has, very importantly, uh, a mind, enun. Now what we have there, then, is something I think pretty astounding uh, but it's something that will certainly carry us through to Friday's lecture because what we'll see is that the Stoics seem to pick up very strongly on these suggestions put forward by Plato and the Timaeus and are very very fond of them and they elaborate them and develop them yes Um, yes, the tripartite uh, nature of the of the human soul, of course, uh, is something that's, uh, that's um, predominates in the Republic. Um, 
in some of the dialogues, Plato gives us slightly different views, different versions of what the human soul is like. For example, in the, um, in the Phaedo, he doesn't actually have a tripartite soul, interestingly. Um, the Phaedo has only, effectively, the soul and the body. So in the Phaedo, the desires come from the body. It's the body that actually has the desires. The desires emerge from them. Whereas in the Republic, the desires and appetites are actually part of the soul. The soul has an appetitive and desiring uh, section to it. Um, in this particular instance, the instance of the, of the, the universe and trying to visualize it as is being done here as a, an ensouled living being with a mind, it's not entirely clear how much of the um, divisions of the soul we're meant to put into this. But I think we are probably meant to include them if we wish. Because there's nothing, although he's stressed simply the idea of soul and the idea of nous, there's, there's nothing, of course, to prevent the idea of the universe having desires of some kind. Um, it doesn't have, he stresses, funnily enough, later on, I haven't included those quotes, it doesn't have legs and eyes. It doesn't need legs. That sounds wonderfully naive, doesn't it? But there's something beautiful about that naivety and quite deliberate. The universe doesn't need legs because it doesn't need to go anywhere. The, the universe doesn't have eyes because there's nothing for it to see outside itself, he says. It's, it's quite nicely put. Um, so I think what... Plato has tried to do here is to improve on Anaxagoras' notion of nous. Because here, the nous of the artisan does have some purpose. It has produced a universe of a particular kind of shape and character because it is the best for it to be that kind of character and shape. It's best for it to be like that. Um, that's what he elaborates in the Timaeus which I'll certainly put on your list of things that you can read in the entirety. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult text, the Timaeus. So I've, you know, you know, I've read it many times, and I don't really understand everything that's going on there. But uh, yeah, it repays, I think, continuous reading. And it was obviously a text that fascinated people um, throughout the ages, particularly in the Renaissance. Yeah, so um, just to maybe finish. The God made this visible world then resemble the most completely perfect of intelligible things. It's, it's, it's a very, people often talk about Plato being kind of anti the material world, but in fact, he's incredibly charitable about it. The universe is the most beautiful thing that there is, actually. And the reason why it's so beautiful and so good in many respects, is because of what it's based on. It's based on something even greater than we can imagine. So, where do the gods rest then in this? What he says is that the gods are added later. They're inserted along with all these other things. Birds in the air, animals that live in water, animals that go on dry land, which includes us. And unfortunately, then, the gods of this world will have to be also entities of becoming, not of being. Why? Because we can see them. Because the stars are gods. We even sometimes have names for them. Uh, there's no act of planet Jupiter, for example, or if you're a Greek Zeus. <laughs> we can see Zeus in the sky at night. Uh, at certain times of the year. So the fact we can see Zeus means that he's a god of becoming. So there must be other gods. Gods who are not gods of becoming, but gods of being. But they're not, they're not in this universe of ours. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what you do with that, but... <laughs> But anyway, um, yeah, this will prepare us quite nicely for, for, um, for Friday. And I think we'll give you some quite nice sort of base for the Aristotle lecture tomorrow, which Tom will give. Yeah. 
Uh, I've been terrible about leaving too much time for questions, but I'm delighted to stay as long as you like. Any, any questions? That Yes. 